Hello, welcome to Books in the Wild, the podcast about exploring books. I'm Carrie Schroeder. In this second episode of Books in the Wild, I have a riveting tale about a newspaper that was produced in the trenches during World War I. But first I wanted to share some updates about the podcast and book art news. I've added some features at booksinthewild.com that I think are pretty fun. There's now a tab labeled Reading List, which shows the show notes and links to all the books and any other reference material that I've mentioned in the show. It's kind of like bonus content, except that you have to do the rest of the work. Secondly, I'm trying my best to produce new episodes on a regular basis. My goal is to publish two episodes monthly, but because I'm a small team of one, this has been challenging. So if you're wondering, how can I help? There is now a support page on booksinthewild.com. On this page, there is a wish list of books for research material. It's also a great place for you to scope out new books if you like the content of this podcast. I've also updated the About page with links to my own work for the curious at coyotebonespress.com. Your support certainly does not need to be monetary, because obviously, as a podcast for book arts by a book artist, it's not like we're really rolling in dough over here. I mean, if you go into the arts for money, I would say that you've made a poor financial decision. Anyway, you can always support the show by simply just sharing it with your friends, family, or even strangers if you'd like. Just go to the website and subscribe on whatever app that you use to listen to this. If you have any ideas for the show or if you want to collaborate on an episode or share your story, please feel free to contact me at booksinthewildpodcast at gmail.com or find me on Facebook at Books in the Wild Podcast. Now for some book arts news. Today is March 11th, 2017, so feel free to ignore this if it's outdated by the time you get to it or if you're listening from the future. Seattle folks, the renowned book artist Julie Chen is having her 30-year retrospective exhibition at the University of Washington. Next week, Julie will be giving an artist talk on Thursday, March 16th at 7 p.m. at the University of Washington, followed by a reception at the Special Collections Library. This event is free and open to the public and will be an amazing opportunity to view the 30 years of artist books produced by Julie Chen and Flying Fish Press. Then on Saturday, March 18th at 3.30 p.m., Intersections of Life and Art, a conversation between Julie Chen and Lois Morrison, moderated by Sandra Krupa, will be held at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. For more information, you can go to flyingfishpress.com or check out Flying Fish Press's Facebook page. Another cool project worth mentioning is a call for submissions for the Rising Together Digital Archive of Zines and Traveling Exhibition, hosted by the College Book Art Association. This will be a four-year digital and traveling exhibition of artist books and zines based on social justice themes. This call is open to all, and you do not need to be a CBAA member to participate. For more information, visit collegebookart.org. And finally, if you have any book art-related news that you would like to be included in the next episode, please send me the information at booksinthewildpodcast at gmail.com. And now, on with the show. Gentlemen, welcome to the cloth hall at Ypres. The best ventilated hall in the town. <laughs> Tonight, for your delectation, we proudly present positively the greatest collection of performers ever collected in one place at one time. Yes, it's Mr. Thomas Atkins and Co. in their stupendous new review, The Big Bangs, I hear. With music by Mr. R. Tillery. <laughs> and not to mention Miss Miniwertha, who always meets with a thunderous reception. Humor has always been used as a weapon to combat the horrors in life. British soldiers during World War I found respite from the turmoil of trench warfare in the form of a satirical newspaper called the Wipers Times. Today we'll delve into some of the history, the processes, and production of the Wipers Times. There is a bit of specialized military jargon in this episode. Most of it can be figured out through context, but if you aren't super savvy with British World War I slang, I've included a brief glossary in the blog post at booksinthewild.com.
1916 marked the third year of the First World War. It was during this year that Germany began its 10-month attack on Verdun, the longest battle of the war, and the Battle of the Somme, the bloodiest battle, with over one million casualties in just four and a half months. It is in 1916, in Ypres, Belgium, where the story of the Wipers Times begins. Though Belgium tried to remain neutral, the city of Ypres quickly developed a substantial role in World War I. Being unfortunately positioned between Germany's offensive path to France, it was soon bombarded by German forces, which subsequently pulled Allied defenses into Belgium. Battles at Ypres were especially heinous. They were the first to see the use of chemical warfare in combat, soldiers becoming blind and choking on chlorine and mustard gas. It was also one of the sites of the unofficial Christmas truce of 1914, where German and Allied soldiers laid down arms and came together to exchange gifts like cigarettes and candies, which only added to the terrible, reluctant bloodshed and this bittersweet romanticism of the Great War. The British Expeditionary Forces, or BEF for short, was the British army that fought on the Western Front during World War I. Stationed at the front lines of Ypres since August of 1915, the BEF's 12th Battalion, known as the Sherwood Foresters, was a service regiment that notoriously suffered from lack of equipment and proper training. Captain Frederick J. Roberts led this motley crew. Roberts was born in London to a middle-class family, but had moved to South Africa to become a diamond prospector. When Britain went to war in 1914, Roberts moved back to enlist. The Sherwood Foresters consisted mo mainly of the working class, mostly miners, farmers, and general laborers. As a pioneer or service regiment, it was their responsibility to dig and redig the miles and miles of trenches that zigzagged across the land known as Ypres Salient in Belgium. Captain Roberts and his men had to not only defend themselves against enemy attacks, but also against the trenches themselves, that were in constant danger of flooding, infection, and disease, and rats. In early 1916, on an excursion through the ruined city of Ypres, Captain Roberts, Lieutenant Jack Pearson, and luckily, Sergeant George Turner, who happened to be a job printer in his civilian life, came across a slightly damaged printing press amongst the rubble of a bombed-out building in Cloth Hall which is a large medieval marketplace in Ypres. The soldiers took a few drawers of type back with them to the trenches, and they began to set the text for what would become the Wipers Times. When they were done setting the text, they would wait for a relatively quiet moment and then carefully but quickly run back to the press at Cloth Hall. Ypres is spelled Y-P-R-E-S, and so Wipers poked fun at the common English mispronunciation of the name. Since the first issue, the Wipers Times was largely satire and gallows humor, complete with fake advertisements and letters to the editors. Think of it as a precursor to the politically charged, satirical, and absurdist papers of today, like The Onion or, lately, just the news in general. In just one year, the battalion suffered from a German gas attack at Volvergem, and then were subsequently relocated to the Somme, where they saw action at the Battle of Guillemont. They printed six more issues during this time, under the names The New Church Times, The Camel Times, and The Somme Times, respective to where they were stationed. In the spring of 1917, they were at the Battle of Vimy Ridge, then in June they saw action at the Battle of Messines. And then in October, they were back for their third battle at Ypres. Because of the constant relocation, in December of 1916, they had settled on the BEF Times for British Expeditionary Forces. They produced 11 issues under this name from March of 1917 until February of 1918. Then, in late 1918, they published two special issues to commemorate the end of World War I, aptly titled the better times. It's common to refer to the entire collection of papers as the Wipers Times, which is something that you'll hear me do throughout this episode. Lord. 
Now what the bloody hell is that? That Smith is an Arab. More stupid, Sam. The Arabs, an Anglo-American hand-fed platinum press. It's probably the finest in the world. It's a manual pedal-operated printing machine, patented in 1872 by Josiah Wade, manufactured in Halifax, subsequently sold all over the world. In short, it's a work of art. So, shall we smash it up? No! Stupid dod. Look, it's even got the blocks and the trays of type. Go on, stick that over there, Smith. Look. How on earth do you know all this, Harris? Well, I was a printer in Suey Street, sir. Good grief. You kept quiet about that. <laughs> Didn't seem relevant to fighting Fritz, sir. No. It might be now. Can you make this work? Well, I mean, it's not been used for a while. You know, the types all over the countryside. And a few unwelcome visitors. But given a bit of time, reckon so, sir. Yes, sir. How's it work then, son? Well, you stick the ink on that plate there, and the rollers come down onto the block there. Paper goes in there. Don't touch it. Very interesting. But what are we going to do with it? We're going to borrow it. Isn't that looting? No, no. It's temporary requisitioning of civilian facilities for military purposes. Oh. Sounds like looting. Have you ever done any journalism? Yes. Good God, no. Excellent. Me neither. Because what we're going to do is we're going to produce a newspaper, Army Sergeant. You say so, sir? What, like the Daily Mail? I was thinking something rather more accurate. The Times? The Wipers Times. It appears that three different presses were used to print the total 23 issues. If you watch the BBC film The Wipers Times, which I highly recommend that you do, two presses appear. The Arab, a British hand-fed platen press, and then later a small tabletop press that they transported with them. The Wipers Times newspaper itself does document some information about the presses used and how they found them. The first press was indeed a platen press, which remained at Cloth Hall, to which the men would transport type to and from. This press was used to print the first three issues of the Wipers Times before it was destroyed by a collapsed wall in March of 1916. The second press mentioned was a cropper, on which nine issues of the Wipers Times was printed before it too was destroyed by a German mini. In January of 1917, they managed to find a small jigger press, which they took with them on relocations and on which the remaining 11 issues were printed. The physical form of the Wipers Times varied, but on average consisted of a sewn 7-inch by 11-inch chapbook of about 8 pages. Or, to better visualize, four pieces of paper printed on the front and back, folded in half, and then sewn in the middle to hold it together. Reoccurring features of the Wipers Times consisted of editorial notes with updates and information never short on gallows humor. The paper was full of ads for things like submarine accident insurance and real estate listings for underground residences, complete and ready for habitation. The paper was also not shy about ridiculing superior officers, who they felt held cushy desk jobs while the soldiers were stuck in the trenches. This, as you can imagine, was not appreciated by the superior officers. However, as it seemed to lift the spirits of the men, and there were no doubt more important issues at hand, the paper continued without much interference. Captain Roberts and his men were persistent. In each location that the Sherwood Foresters were stationed, they tried their best to produce regular papers. These men were surviving, fighting on the front lines in the trenches of the largest and bloodiest battle that the world had ever seen. These men witnessed unimaginable horrors and confronted death every day. Often when we see movies about trench warfare, we only see the actual fighting on screen. We see the gas attacks and the artillery shells and the grenades. We see the desolate no man's land and the men tangled in barbed wire. What we don't usually see is the time span between attacks, the relatively quiet time where these young men had nothing to do except for prepare for the next attack and to contemplate their own mortality. So instead of letting the worst sink in, 
the Wipers Times allowed them to focus on happy distractions. Things like announcements for the grand opening of the Dead Cow Farm Cinemas, or the adventures of Herlock Sholmes, a mystery spoof, and quizzes to find out if they were suffering from the dangerous syndrome called optimism. Do you suffer from optimism but fail to recognize the telltale signs? Many do. This is serious, Doctor. I just need you to answer a few simple questions. Do you sometimes wake up in the morning feeling that all is going well for the Allies? Yes, Doctor. Do you sometimes think that the war will be over within the next 12 months? Absolutely, Doctor. Do you consider that our leaders are competent to conduct the war to a successful issue? I should say so, Doctor. Oh, dear. This is the worst case of cheerfulness I've encountered. Oh, good. No, it's terrible. But don't worry. I promise I can cure you of optimism within two days and effectively eradicate all traces of it from your system. Really, Doctor? And how are you going to do that? I'm writing something for you now that should do the trick. Is it a prescription, Doctor? No, it's your orders. I'm sending you to the front line. Thank you, Doctor. The Wipers Times was edited by Captain Roberts, with Lieutenant Jack Pearson listed as sub-editor, and Sergeant George Turner as the printer. Many different soldiers' initials were attributed to the various content throughout the paper. One regular contributor was British novelist Gilbert Franco, who later became well-known for his poetry and prose concerning World War I. Despite being at the center of a world war, the Wipers' Times remained a priority of the soldiers, it gave them something to look forward to, a welcome break from their hellish surroundings. Laura Clouding, the curator at the Imperial War Museum in London, said that the Wipers' Times was, quote, a coping mechanism. Everyone uses humor to diffuse a difficult situation. These men were enduring the most extraordinary suffering and hardship, and one outlet was to joke at the unjokeable. It shows that they weren't numbers, they were creative, funny, emotional human beings, end quote. Captain Frederick Roberts recognized the cathartic and healing properties of humor when his men were inundated with anxiety and fear. With jokes and cute nicknames for things like incoming artillery shells as whiz-bangs, or minis for Minenwerfer, German mine launchers, it's possible that the paper could come off as a bit callous at times. However, resonating throughout the Wipers' times is a pervading somberness and a sincere mourning for those whom they have lost. This is a poem titled To My Chum, written by an uncredited soldier in issue four. No more we'll share the same old barn, the same old dugout, same old yarn. No more a tin of bully share nor split our room by a star shell's glare. So long, old lad. What times we've had, both good and bad, we've shared what shelter could be had. The same crump hole, while the whiz-bang shrieked. The same old billet that always leaked. And now, we've stopped one. We'd weathered the storms two winters long, we managed to grin when all went wrong because together we'd fought and fed. Our hearts were light, but now you're dead and I'm Mabelis. Poetry, though beautiful and at times necessary, was kept to a minimum in the Wipers times, maybe in a way to limit the amount of emotional investment. The following is a notice from Captain Roberts in the Wipers times number four, volume two. Notice, we regret to announce that an insidious disease is affecting the division, and the result is a hurricane of poetry. Subalterns have been seen with a notebook in one hand and bombs in the other, absently walking near the wire in deep communion with the muse. Even quartermasters with books, note, one, and pencil copying break into song, while arguing the point, re, boots, gum, thigh. The editor would be obliged if a few of the poets would take a break into prose, as a paper cannot live by poems alone. 
On November 11, 1918, Germany, bereft of manpower and supplies and facing imminent invasion, signed an armistice agreement with the Allies putting an end to the First World War. In total, the Great War left 9 million soldiers dead, 21 million wounded, and at least 5 million civilians dead. At the end of the war, two last issues were printed by Captain Roberts and his men, under the title, The Better Times. In the very last issue of The Better Times, published in December of 1918, carried the headline, Christmas, Peace, and Final Number, and featured somewhat bittersweet musings on the end of the war. Fake ads were still printed, this time selling bundles of unknown origin and thrashing machines which they claimed had been used on the Allies but were no longer needed. There was even an open call to cast your vote on who they had thought won the war. The front page editorial written by Roberts himself took on a final, serious, almost disillusioned tone, devoid of the usual light-hearted humor. One cannot but remark on the absolute apathy with which the end was received over here. England seems to have had a jollification, but here one saw nothing but a disinterested interest in passing events. Perhaps that was because the end came without the expected cumulative crash, and the decisive battle was spread over many months, and so became an indefinite action and not a show. Anyway, though some may be sorry it's over, there is little doubt that the line men are not, as most of us have been cured of any little illusions that we may have had about the pomp and glory of war, and know it for the very vilest disaster that can befall mankind. In all, there were 23 issues published by the 12th Battalion Sherwood Foresters from 1916 to 1918. Print runs ranged from 100 to 300 each. The Wipers Times created an outlet for the soldiers in the trenches, a welcome distraction from the world around them that was falling apart. It is the definition of gallows humor. When one is faced with a situation so bleak, horrible, and hopeless— there is often a paradoxical reaction to laugh or joke about it. It's a defense mechanism, cushioning the blow of the inevitable. However, once these situations shift, the need for gallows humor is usually eliminated. After the war, Captain Frederick J. Roberts lived in the United States and in Canada. He sought to continue a career in editing, but was reportedly turned down by publishers due to the unofficialness of his prior editing experiences. He briefly took a job creating crossword puzzles for a small newspaper before returning to mine prospecting. He passed away in 1964 in Toronto at the age of 82. In an interview with Captain Roberts's grandson honoring the 100 years since the Wipers Times inaugural issue, he said that his grandfather never ever spoke about the war or what went on in the trenches. Original issues of The Wipers' Times are scarce. However, if you would like to read more, you can easily find scanned copies online or in printed collections like The Wipers' Times, the famous World War Trench newspaper, published in 2016 by Bloomsbury. I also recommend the 2013 BBC film The Wipers' Times, which did a great job at bringing elements from the paper to life. This is where the clips of the optimism skit and the reading of the poem To My Chum were sampled. Finally, to end this episode, even though Captain Roberts wrote often and passionately about his disdain for poetry, Roberts himself wrote a poem in the last issue of The Better Times, titled, Our Second Time on Earth. Our Second Time on Earth You know of the phoenix, a wonderful bird, and his powers, I think you'll agree, are a marvel, he rises from the ashes I've heard like Venus straight up from the sea. So we, though no power is supernatural we claim, have yet compassed a similar feat, and out of the ashes enshrining our fame have arisen refreshed and complete. We bade you a fond and touching farewell, 
We wished you good luck and Godspeed. Our obsequies went off remarkably well, though the time was a sad one indeed. But now we return to our labors once more, and sadness is cast to the winds. Throw open the wide editorial doors, draw the curtains and pull up the blinds. As the clown in the old fashioned panto appears and greets you with formula terse, so we, bidding smiles, take the place of your tears. Send forth hearty greetings and verse. Once more we emerge with the wave of a hand right into the glare of the limes, and once more we proclaim. We are yours to command. The editor, the better times. Thank you for listening. I'm Carrie Schroeder. For more information, check out booksinthewild.com.